I'm very glad to say that we're joined by Daniel Gortz. Hey David, good to see you again. Yeah, you too. <laughs> this is going to be a conversation about metamodernism and the particular form of metamodernism that Daniel and Hansi Freinacht, Daniel's alter ego, is known for. I've got a few questions. So we'll, Daniel and I will talk for about 45 minutes or so before we'll shift to the Q&A portion. Daniel, welcome. I'd, I'd like to ask, just so we can get it out of the way, you are both Daniel Gortz and Hansi Freinacht? Well, so I'm Daniel Gortz. Hansi Freinacht lives in the Alps. And uh, he also lives in the virtual realm, and he resides at a very uh, at a very specific crossroads there, at the crossroads of fact and fiction. And fact and fiction is also where the imagination meets the political, and uh, where really interesting things can happen. If you uh, imagine something and then you work really hard at it, sometimes it becomes real. The term metamodern obviously kind of points to the idea that there are distinct phases, modernism, postmodernism, which is essentially kind of deconstructive, and then metamodernism is one of the words that seems to be applied to this place beyond that is some kind of resolution of the tension between modernism and, and postmodernism. And there's obviously lots of other intellectual communities or people talking about different frames that maybe point to, to, to the same thing or a similar kind of resolution. And I'd love to start by just framing your work within that, because I think a lot of people on the call will be aware of the sense-making web, for example, um, Game B, the integral communities. What relationship does, does metamodernism and your work specifically have to that? How would you position it? So, so roughly speaking, uh... Metamodernism is closest of those things to uh, to integral theory, uh, from which it sprang to, to a to a large uh, to, to a large extent. So, um, uh, some years back, uh, I um, uh, was very interested in integral theory. I started applying it also in academia. You couldn't really use it. Um, couldn't really use it explicitly because people would be suspicious of this uh, bald, crazy Ken Wilber type and, and uh, talk about spirituality and stuff like that. But you just supply the maps just spontaneously or, or within any topic and was kind of having a cheat code. It's like, wow. Uh, you, you, you can stump the professors if you want, and you can go and say interesting things in any topic because it's like we're in a in a renaissance time, as I think uh, our mutual friend and acquaintance um, Andrew Sweeney has has written about. Uh, and there's like for those who can sense that what's coming next, there's a lot of low hanging fruit. You can kind of ru run around and pick it. And also in the realm of theory, and also in the realm of then inventing stuff in, in society. So I uh, I got really interested in that while being a sociologist and um, and doing police research and more mainstream stuff like that. Uh, and. I uh, wanted to apply uh, integralism to the political realm in progressive countries like Sweden. It looked it, in those theories as the wait a minute, you could, you can, what happens if you gather all of these yellow people, so to speak, and turquoise people, or like th those are th those that resonate with integralism and have certain traits, developmental traits, and so on. And it didn't quite work out. It was very difficult to make it like to make it political. And it just also attracted particularly perhaps folks who are very interested in the spiritual part of it. Kind of, there was a longing for, for this kind of uh, civic conversation that would include spiritual and, and existential aspects of life. Uh, so, so the organization that I started to get with some friends, one of them was Emil, who is also part of Meta Moderna, together with whom I later wrote the books, um, is, um, uh, I mean, we noticed through that work that it didn't become political, it just became this civil society thing. And we also noticed that integral theory wasn't that good at it. And it also had 
is, and which isn't so strange. It's not a social theory. It's not a political theory. It wasn't designed to do that, really. Um, and it also had too many loopholes in terms of a, a little bit too much magical thinking here and there and a little bit too much woo-woo, a little bit too soft uh, soft edges. And, and the aesthetics weren't quite appealing to most people, and particularly not the cultural elites. I mean, it was kind of new agey and kind of had this hysterical, shiny um, undertone, like, like they would... Sh- shake you almost like come on wake up we're doing this awesome thing it's going to be super duper awesome we're going to be superhuman and you're going to we're all going to evolve into these super duper people and, and then you look at the results some years later and there's significant fallout actually there's you know been a cult in those circles uh, a lot of people have been really hurt a lot of people have had too high expectations so have come a little bit bitter and so on uh mental health issues too uh, so, I mean, well, that kind of disillusionment brought me like, okay, let's 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 sober up for a bit. Uh, brought me into this uh, back to this postmodern ironic stance a little bit about it, and then, voila, on the internet, I find there is something else uh, that claims to come after um, after uh, postmodernism, and it's metamodernism, and uh, and. Beautifully, it was connect, connected to the deeper strands of popular culture and to the arts, and it had like a much more suggestive aesthetic. It would have some hope or some sincerity, but you know, subtly suggested or like Im, Im, implied, kind of. Um, so, so those theorists, one of them, Luke Turner, he wrote a, a manifesto was signed by this guy. Uh, um, this this Hollywood guy who, who plays in Transformers and CS uh, music video, um, yeah, whatever his name was, Shia LaBeouf. Yes, Shia LaBeouf, please. Uh, thanks. Uh, and um, it, he wrote that there is an oscillation then between sincerity and irony in this manifesto, and between naivety and and well informed naivety, realism and the magical, and that kind of hit home. I said, wow. Like that kind of self irony, that kind of oscillation, kind of dis- dis- self depreciation, uh, and also that kind of play, playfulness is kind of what what metamodernism, what what, what integral needs. Uh, there there were other theorists. There were theorists who were like really you know dense cultural theorists uh, who were into the minutia of arts, and and this had become quite a thing for some years, around uh, the years after two thousand ten. And they were analyzing literature, they were analyzing uh, music, they were analyzing architecture. It was all fascinating. But it, if you looked at their politics, it was, you know, be against neoliberalism, um, uh, be uh, basi- basically the same critical intellectual left as everywhere else in, in the humanities and academia, which wasn't what an integral politics would imply. An integral politics would imply uh, to create institutions that would support our development and our relationships and the emergent generative uh, conditions for for different emergent patterns in our lives and to make those as visible as possible in the discourse, which is lacking. So basically we married that impulse that well, so politicized integralism with not the cultural theory of metamodernism in and of itself. Uh, some of the cultural theorists they became quite insulted that we uh, that we Shanghai their term and narrowed it to to both politics and and to to integralism and to developmental psychology and to complexity science and to other, well a host of other things that they they didn't uh, use it for. Uh, but as we write in the book, it's. Um, um, we felt uh, we felt it's okay to do it. Uh, it it's uh, idealistic. It's an idealistic piracy. Information has to be open. Uh, whoever has the best meaning that can of a term that can uh, help society the most should get to use it. And then we also reached out uh, to to the theorists and so on. And, and some of them responded positively. Some not. Um, however, a lot of them got a lot of new new followers, and so uh, because they got a bit more known in new networks through our stuff, and so the term metamodern is kind of uh, kind of um, t- 
took the place in many in many regards of what had formerly been integralist, particularly in in a certain segment of the European intelligentsia and and uh, and uh, what uh, Brent Kubras and and uh, uh, Jonathan Rosen have called uh, the emergentsia. Uh, and that's kind of where it is now. So it's become a fairly household term on the progressive internet. Yeah, so I mean, that's a good place to start is that I know there are some tensions within people who feel that they've been using the word metamodern before Hansi came along, but Hansi has been so successful in defining a certain type of metamodernism that some people feel are unhappy that in a way you've been too successful, you've kind of redefined metamodernism in a way that they don't feel entirely comfortable with. Could you just explain what, what that's about? What is your particular version of it and how does it differentiate from the way that other people use the term and why are there those tensions? Yeah, yeah. So, so there is. Uh, I, I can make uh, uh, make uh, some some recommendations for upcoming stuff. Um, uh, what one thing that's upcoming is uh, a reader, metamodern reader, but it's called something else, something about the Anthropocene. It's uh, um, edited by our um, common friend uh, Jonathan Rosen, uh, and. Um, in that, Jonathan tries to repair and and uh, heal kind of this little uh, schism. Uh, in everyday life, I'm almost not touched by it because I don't deal too much with with the with the uh, cultural theories, except I follow them on on uh, social media and read some of their stuff and read their articles and so on. Um, but uh, by and large, you could call it the Dutch school and the Nordic school. So the Dutch school uh, that refers to the two theorists, the cultural theorists or arts theorists, uh, uh, Vermeulen and Van der Acker, uh, Tim Vermeulen and Robin Van der Acker. And uh, that's the one that has been established within academia. Uh, and uh, uh, the Nordic school started kind of with, with Emil and me, uh, which is uh, overtly political, uh, has this idea that we have to uh, help society somehow along the way to develop new sensitive patterns that, uh, that uh, well, heal us and, and uh, scaffold our, our shared development. Uh, so th that, that's kind of the main, the main difference. And then, then the way we use metamodernism, uh, because it's uh, so closely related to how integralism used integral, then we we have a broader idea of of what metamodern means. I, I go through six different meanings actually in, in my chapter of, of uh, Jonathan's uh, upcoming uh, book, mm -hmm. and uh, and those different meanings could be like uh, well the cultural phase as they have described it, the the Dutch theorists and others also American theorists as well, and. Uh, there's a big one in Romania. Um, and uh, I mean, other than that, you can view it as a developmental state. So you can say that something is metamodern. So people will sometimes ask, is Jordan Peterson metamodern? And in many ways, yeah, he is. Like he, he reinvents religion in post-rational ways. Uh, he uh, 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 plays with sincerity and irony in many ways. Uh, Etc. Right? Uh, then perhaps not on the same political train as we uh, as we uh, bring up in the book. But you you can look at integralism. Is that metamodern? Yeah, in many in many ways, it lacks some of those design interventions that that we have proposed. Uh, is uh, is a certain theory or thought pattern metamodern? Well, it's it's a matter of discussion. A person can can be at a certain developmental stage, but not have access to certain ideas, and then they will still kind of act metamodern and without knowing it. Or they can uh, have access to the, the ideas, but use them in a flat version uh, because they don't have that cognitive complexity or uh, depth of understanding or whatever, or the context just to 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 do it. So. I've heard your work described as political metamodernism. Is mm -hmm. that fair? 
Yes, yes. Uh, so uh, the, the Nordic school of political metamodernism, uh, and I'm happy with that qualifier. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not out to disturb the, the hard work of all of those theorists who I really like. They, most of them don't like me back, but that's all right. So, so I'd like to, to, to give a, you a space now to talk about, I know because we've spoken before that you see this as a, an existential project. Mm -hmm. that you're bringing that sort of level of intensity, maybe ironic sincerity, maybe just sincerity, I don't know. Um, but tell me why it's an existential project and try and try and sell everyone on why, um, yeah, why you think it should be. Well, well so uh, in numero uno, existential projects, uh, <laughs> you don't sell those. Uh, you, you, you can sell, it can sell a few, uh, few books or, or, or uh, snippets uh, um, that, that are interesting. Uh, but existential projects are, of course, co-created, uh, not bought and sold, right? Uh, but, um, but that being said, um, I view it as, as yes, there is a kind of religious, I would even say, undercurrent uh, to, uh, to uh, particularly then political metamodernism. And it has to do with the disenchantment that we experience in our days, right? So modern society is still the uh, predominant form of society because it's a capitalist society. It's still uh, built on, on the uh, democratic structures that are invented essentially 200 years ago. Of course, they have evolved somewhat since. Um, but by and large, the same principles of modernity are still still rule the world, um, mo many or most places. And and then there is the postmodern critique. The farther modernity pro progresses into uh, late modernity, you have uh, different dis different strands of uh, deconstruction, critique, postcolonialism. Uh, uh, racial injustices are uh, made apparent, uh, different contradictions inherent to the modern project itself, like its unsustainability. Roughly speaking, you can say that it's the excessive inequalities, it's the, it's the um, alienation experience in everyday life, and it's the um, unsustainability of the whole project, that if you look down the horizon, unlimited growth on a limited planet, it's not going to hold up. So these things taken together create the, the, the critique. Uh, Metamodernism uh, is, it has the spiritual, uh, I, I would, it, it, it's just sprinkles on the spirituality. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't do what integralism does and uh, says, we're going to work on spirituality, all of us, we're going to wake up. Uh, we're going to um, get in other states and uh, we are going to become more spiritual beings. It just has this like implicit or a little bit of it um, because spir the spiritual and the existential is, of course, in the background all the time. And it underlies all of the all of the questions. So normal thing, uh, being unemployed. What does it mean to be unemployed? How does it feel? Well, all of those things also depend on, well, how people think about it, how we feel about our own identity, how our identities are built up. So we, we can't avoid that part. And if we can't avoid it, we might as well, and, and if it's too dangerous and it gets too culty, if you try to jump right in, let's play on the border. Uh, that's the... It, I, it's not radical conservatism because that means far right stuff. It's uh, conservative radicalism, and um, and this existential part uh, that's that's where the sincerity comes in, right? So spiritual experiences are still real, right? Are we just going to ignore that? And and we, I think you and I, and pretty much most people on the call, will have had some kind of spiritual experiences sometimes in their lives, uh, which have changed our perspectives and which have changed the directionalities and trajectories of our lives and the projects that we engage with. So obviously, if we want to change the world, we're going to have to touch carefully on that. Um, so, uh, I mean, what kind of, what kind of religion uh, is that? Well, it's, it's a religion which is 
fairly Nietzschean. You've killed God, be done with it. And then we, you, well, you know, God always comes back three days later after you kill them, just in a slightly different format. And, um, and then we're becoming part of reinventing the divine, uh, that, would, that which is transcendent and or imminent, um, that which um, is transrational, uh, those things that within the religions that were true, that are right, that modernity threw out with the bathwater, um, all of those things we need to start playing with, right? Uh, otherwise, we're not going to be successful. And also, we're not going to have, um, we're not going to be taking the issue seriously enough, right? Uh, that we kind of have to save our souls, but at the same time, not be fanatics about it. Um, and then that requires a certain irony. So again, you have this oscillation. Actually, oscillation is what what the initial modernists uh, proposed. I kind of prefer the word superposition, that they're like both there and one kind of constitutes the other, but they're in two places at the same time, right? Um, so, so you're both in extreme nihilism and irony and an extreme sincerity, uh, like religious sincerity. And voila, if you kind of ground the wire with that irony, with that play, with that self-distance, um, and, and, and to a certain extent with virtuality, uh, the internet has uh, tremendous qualities in that regard. If, if the wire is grounded, you can allow yourself a little bit more like, okay, I'm going to fucking believe in this. I'm, I'm going to make it my life mission. I'm going to be, I'm going to be a little bit French revolution about this. And then you can have the crazy eyes just for a moment. And then if you, if you, if that, if, if, you know, crazy eyes stay on too long, go have a drink, have a beer, forget about it for a while. And uh, yeah, switch tactics a little bit. I guess a lot of people on the call will be familiar with integral theory, and that's probably um, the most well-known developmental theory of which yours is takes influence with and is a, a refinement of. Um, I know you're doing a talk for the integral conference, or may have done already. I'm not sure. Maybe one coming up. And the que the the title of the talk is "Friend or Foe to Integral," which I thought was um, without giving it giving away completely what you're going to say. Would you Would you say "Friend or Foe to Integral"? Uh, so, so uh, uh, I, I don't quite remember uh, if this is one that I've already given or or not. Um, uh, it's uh, well, just just the calendar has been full and, and stuff. But um, uh, I mean, metamodernism is eighty five percent friend and fifteen percent foe. So foe to magical thinking, um, uh, foe to uh, to the processes that. Um, that alienate, I mean, the, the promise of integral is uh, we're going to have meta theory and it's going to be very uh, uh, inclusive also of inner aspects and, and uh, the, the lived aspects of existence mm, and spirituality, of course. Uh, and we're going to, it's going to take its place as a meta theory to integrate the knowledge out there in the world and, and, and coordinate it. Uh, now, if you do go to an integral conference, like almost everybody I know outside of the integral community would be severely alienated if they went, uh, because you have uh, people believing in all, sor all sorts of stuff. So, like uh, um, uh, family uh, constellation therapy, where you you are believed to change the 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 energy patterns of a certain family through, through a kind of role play. Uh, I mean, I'm sure role play around family structures can be, can be very, uh, can, can be very powerful. Uh, but if you add the black box of magic, uh, like we're changing the energies and, and people will believe in other things, right? That, uh, I don't know. Um, 
um, llamas in Tibet can walk through walls and uh, that if you burn their corpses, there will be gems coming up and it, all, all sorts of these, you know, religious or magical views that are pre-modern, right? Uh, so, so those I take issue with and, and I want to make them visible. And I actually want to also call the uh, integral community, um, um, well, just to run responsibility for what is this, right? Can you explain this? Can you stand for this? And will it have harmful effects? And it will have harmful effects because when you let magic in the door, arbitrariness comes in. And with arbitrariness, uh, misuse of power comes in, unfortunately. And people also start creating hierarchies around who's most enlightened and so on. And you can never disprove those hierarchies nor prove them, right? Um, so so th things can get very, very arbitrary. And there's also in that a kind of totalitarian, um, a totalitarian aspect that, uh, that it, it attempts to capture everything. It's not open-ended enough, right? In, in a sense, it's a little bit, this mistake goes even back to Hegel, right? That he said, and then everything le leads up to Prussia, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> and um, an integral is a bit like that. Everything leads up to uh, Adida or something. And, and then, of course, there are there are some. I take some issue with with some of Wilbur's um, Wilbur's um, um, the, the main integral writer uh, his uh, models. So some of the models. I mean, the models are brilliant, but they, there were some mistakes there, um, which which became apparent after some time. Um, and it, another thing is its aesthetics. Then um, that uh, this this, uh, this spiritual undercurrent, uh, or it's not just an undercurrent; it's a flood. The spiritual deluge uh, that is in integralism uh, brings with it uh, the aesthetic forms that are a little bit hysterical, which can never become a social a movement for social change because. Well, it, it, it's almost indistinguishable from Scientology, right? Uh, and uh, people will be suspicious, and for good reason. Uh, so, so, and also then the fact that integralism uh, doesn't quite, um, doesn't quite make it to become a political theory or, or a social theory, a theory of social change, kind of outlines, well, here's a ladder, um, and it also kind of tends to stare a little bit too much at that ladder. I, I think these are these are common these are common concerns these days, right? Uh, so what I well I'm focusing on the faux part, but but the friend part is like yes, there is something after uh, postmodernism. Yes, development is real. Yes, holistic maps of the world are incredibly useful. And yes, they are the solution to the sense-making crisis. And yes, a lot more people could learn them. And yes, we could re re recreate our institutions and societies along those lines. Uh, the, the problem has been, and this is something I'm, that's very dear to my heart, is um, that we have never quite opened up the discussion of metamodern, or not metamodern, on meta-theoretical development. So these large maps about what what are the aspects of reality? How, how does everything fit together? People kind of just, well, just park their cars in Wilbur's parking lot. And then a lot of, uh, a lot of singular individuals did diff made different, um, and theoretical developments on that, but those are experts in different fields and they can't quite communicate. Uh, so, so we've kind of been in a rut or, or locked down for a long time. And all and all, each of those uh, meta theorists, people who come up with their own theories of everything, are very complex thinkers, um, and they're kind of and, and they feel that wow, this could change the world, and they feel that nobody's listening to them, and not even the other meta theorists, and they don't even understand each other. Uh, so it's it's uh, I think meta theory needs to become a serious discipline. Uh, with his own methodology. A friend of mine is working on such a thing uh, as we speak. Um, and it's going to come out in, uh, 
in as a book chapter in this uh, uh, second volume of Meta Theory by Sean Bjorn Hargens and Nick Hedlund, who are the editors, and the writer I'm talking about is uh, is uh, Johan Ranefels. Um, and uh, they need a methodology, or we need a methodology, and we need a community um, which is capable of dealing with very sensitive topics. So each one of these meta theorists will have spent 10, 15, 20 years. There is basically their life work and they believe in it very, very much. And they really sorely want some recognition for all of that. Uh, so if you put these together, they're supposed to critique each other to create something, a bigger whole or a better meta theory, one we can agree on and doesn't have the individual pathologies of the others. Uh, it's well. I mean, it's likely to explode. Besides, people who are that smart are often a little bit uh, well, I, uh, neurotypical in different ways, and and there there are all of those issues, right? That uh, you need to um, somehow contain contain that and and make it fruitful and and not embittered. So uh, that's a future path I, I, I sincerely believe in, though. I, I think it has to be done, and I think it will be done. I think uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger's work, um, I mean, your own, for that matter, uh, I mean, is on the same trail, is on, is, 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 uh, or, or parallel parts of it, right? Yeah, I, I've got one more question, but I might, I think if we shift to the, take, take a couple of questions from, uh, people in the audience, and then if we've got time, I'll, I'll throw this one in towards the end. Um, so looking at the question form, I think to Tobias, I think yours uh, first question there that's got, uh, sorry, second question, it's got a couple of upvotes. That feels appropriate for now, if you wanted to. So uh, I have, as a preamble, I have to say I'm currently reading the listening society and i'm just uh, in the middle of it and i've been very intrigued by the application of the model of hierarchical uh, complexity in all of this and i i'm also um currently reading zach stein and i've been listening to a couple of his interviews and i've heard him critique your application of this to a person's development as opposed to the complexity of the task that they perform. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that. So ultimately speaking, uh, if uh, for, for something like model of hierarchical complexity, which, um, well, for, for those who don't know about it, is uh, mathematization of uh, the, uh, the stages of complexity that were uh, uh, proposed by Piaget once at, uh, once upon a time. And Piaget, he was a, a Swiss theorist and he looked at kids and he noticed that there were these uh, shifts in stages, right? Uh, that uh, uh, up to years four or something like that, uh, a kid won't, if you have a glass of water and then a wider glass and a taller glass, you can pour it back and forth and say, and ask them, where's the most water? And they will point to the, uh, to the taller glass, right? Uh, because it looks more. And then after a while, um, after age five or something, uh, they will say it's the same amount. And everybody seems to go through roughly this shift. You can you can see the same thing in I don't know how kids draw, how kids draw um, um, pictures of human beings or or whatever. There there are uh, discernible stages, and they follow actually the same trajectory. Uh, so um, and. and you can analyze across the different domains and you can see that uh, th there are differences between two-year-olds and, and uh, ten-year-olds, for instance. And then the, the idea that what happened after uh, Piaget was that other people like uh, Lawrence Kohlberg uh, noticed, wait a minute, you can ask like these complex questions to adults and they will also respond in different uh, different. Uh, um, manners, then you can find it, you can systematize how, how they respond and uh, uh, moral dilemmas in his case. And then a host of other researchers came up with something like that. And MHC made it very clear uh, because it, it, it uh, 
uh, could add some some steps that uh, PHA had missed. It could add steps afterwards. It could add steps before. So you could apply it to animals. You could apply it to uh, basically any task from amoeba to Einstein, basically. And and there's a mathematization of an abstract algebra of how they kind of come together. Each stage would coordinate the, the one before it, but it, at the same time, it always depends on it because it's emergent from the interactions of those things, right? <laughs> Non-arbitrarily coordinated. Um, and then for, for adult human beings, it appears as though we have, um, um, well, we're, we're roughly, uh, roughly uh, um, along four different stages. So most people are either abstract at the what's called the abstract stage or the or the formal stage, uh, but then a minority is uh, are at the systematic stage. You can put think in complex systems and see larger pictures and so on and reason about those. And uh, then there's the meta systematic stage that so you can compare different systems and and think across systems and see patterns that, that are applicable across them, right? And you can be creative at that stage. Now, uh, I have great respect for, uh, for uh, Zach's work, and we know each other fairly well. Uh, and uh, I think um, he is correct in, in the very uh, concrete sense that when you make an experiment, and you say, this person performed a task at this order of complexity, or, or you analyze something out there in the world, I don't know, a piece of theory, uh, that is a task, that's not a person, and that's all you'll ever get, right? Um, so so, so in, in a very concrete sense, that, that's, I mean, that's uh, indisputably true. Uh, however, um, uh, there, there are no uh, four-year-olds with Nobel prizes, right? Um, so, so uh, if if you uh, take his position to reductio ad absurdum, um, and and you say, okay, so you can't never say anything about anyone in any context about this. Well, it also gets absurd. Uh, obviously, there is going to be difference between uh, a two-month-old newborn and a twenty-year-old uh, human being, right? Um, so, so across, uh, across ad, ad, adulthood, uh, likely, it's likely that we can have one or two shifts in complexity stages of cognitive complexity. Uh, however, it is unusual. So most people will stay on the, on the level they were at 20. Some people have a shift at 20 or 20. 25 or 30, uh, it's, it's fairly unusual after that. You can grow in other ways, but uh, uh, cognitive complexity uh, uh, shifts are fairly rare. If, if speaking about such, such shifts as, uh, as those stages in childhood, right? Um, so um, what Zach, I believe, um, I think he has a very good reason for, for saying what he says. And the reason is we shouldn't obsess about it, uh, right? We, uh, first of all, and, and it kind of happens to everyone when you first learn this, you can't help but obsess about which stage am I, which stage is that person? And, that, and then after a while you realize there are so many uh, difficulties about it. Uh, you realize that maybe you were staring to unidimensionally at one thing, um, and maybe you over-essentialized how you imagine a certain stage play out. Maybe somebody could only think in a stage in a certain setting where they're the expert. Uh, maybe somebody appeared very smart, but they were actually scaffolded by a social uh, by a social. Um, uh, context, but if you remove that social context, they actually think in, in simpler thoughts. Uh, so for all of those complications, empirical complications, um, well, and not to mention the egalitarian impulse uh, that we have in, in our kinds of societies that we don't want to rank people, right? Uh, there's like the monkey brain kind of does want that, that but our higher selves or our better selves don't want to rank people. Uh, so, so I think what Zach is saying is 
on a purely analytical level, indisputably true. On a moral level, also dis indisputably true. On a practical level, uh, actually untenable. Thank you. Great, thank you. I think, Ethan, your question is up next. Awesome. Uh, hey, Daniel. Uh, thanks for being here. I'm a huge fan of your work, slowly making my way through the two books and all the stuff on your blog, but it definitely is so rich and at a level of complexity that takes me a long time to get through. Um, my question's around the magical thinking stuff. And specifically, like I find myself in a very like spiritual part of my life. And I think I tend to like, as I'm like, going through a lot of these experiences, dip into stuff that you might consider magical thinking. And so I'd love to hear more examples of what you think magical thinking is like in the integral communities, for example. And then maybe also, if you could talk about sort of at a meta level, how you think one should go about classifying things as magical thinking or not when they're trying to make sense of like kind of that border, but really to push the edge of like, you know, what actually might be possible, but without, you know, falling off the cliff and yeah, just speak to that a bit more. Well, well thank, thank you, Ethan. I, I, I love the question. So, so first, first of all, let's, let us contextualize what I mean when I say, well, I'm against magical thinking. Uh, I'm not against magical thinking where it is appropriate, namely in cultures, uh, that are magical or, or animistic or, or is stage after that Faustian, even up to uh, post-Faustian uh, axial age religions and so on. Uh, because in those settings, and particu particularly then in animistic indigenous uh, communities and so on, it would be imperialist to, to be against magical thinking. So people live, uh, I don't know, uh, out on the steps or uh, or uh, in the rainforest or somewhere else and they have their culture and it makes sense to them to talk about uh, spirits uh, it is a good way for uh, people in that setting to make uh, meaning in the world and to uh, relate to the enchanted uh, uh, connection to the environment then it, it's not it's not a pathological thing in that sense, um, and and actually perhaps a very positive thing. It, of course, shamans misuse power. Uh, they will say, uh, uh, I, "I will heal you if you let me sleep with two virgins" or something like that. Right. Uh, so so it happens that magical thinking is misused for 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 power uh, dynamics also in indigenous uh, uh, contexts and so on. Uh, however. Um, if, from in, in societies as complex as ours, uh, with a huge capitalist market and the internet and the rest of it, it can be pretty harmful. I mean, uh, with magical thinking, people can sell you all sorts of products, uh, um, and uh, there's uh, even a kind of class dimension to this. That if you get into spirituality, then you tend to get into magical thinking. Uh, particularly if you're a little bit more desperate and not have uh, so much cognitive complexity in it uh, around yourself or good access to critical thinking and what I call cultural code. So then you will be exploited uh, by a nasty new age uh, hyper commercialism, uh, which will promise you all sorts of things to, to resolve your problems. And actually, they will exacerbate your problems. Um, and uh, rather what you should have done was perhaps get some st stability on your savings account, but you just burned it on, on uh, uh, crystals and healing and uh, uh, synchronicity course and, and, and whatnot. Uh, so uh, that will actually lower your social class. Uh, so it creates, um, it creates, uh, it exacerbates inequality in society. And uh, for that matter, uh, for, for that reason, it, uh, it actually exacerbates instability in society, it exacerbates uh, the misuse of power. Uh, so uh, in, uh, with that contextualization, magical thinking shows up more in highly developed people than in average developed people. Why? 
With highly developed people, you have four different aspects of it, or you, you could uh, theorize this differently, but the way we propose it in the books is, uh, well, you have uh, subjective states, uh, including spiritual states. You have uh, depth, the, the embodiment uh, and integration of subjective states and uh, hell and heaven and, and uh, the subtleties of existence and the subtle body, the causal body, the layers, uh, deeper layers of, of uh, phenomenal uh, experience, a phenomenological experience. And then you have cognitive complexity and then you have code or, or just the thought patterns or, or language games that you're playing. And um, no, like there's no real, uh, from, from what I can see, there's no research on this, but from what I can see just analyzing my networks and myself, there's no real um, correlation between these. So people can grow in either one, right? And whenever people are very high on complexity and code, but not so high on depth and state, they tend to become reductionist. You can, you can get subtly angry at the world because you can always see around the next corner. The world always feels a little disenchanted, right? You always feel that, well, the world is machine, it's it's uh, frisky dirt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I remember feeling this very, very strongly and was uh, like religiously held opinion in my younger self. Um, and then there's um, the depth and, uh, and state. So when those get the upper hand. And this is actually proven empirically. I mean, if you if you have a meditation setting uh, or a simple mindfulness meditation, um, right after, moments after, people will be more uh, e easily uh, uh, suggestible. So you can you can uh, fool people that they have a full a memory that they don't have easier if they've just just meditated. They're in somewhat higher state, right? Uh, so uh, when these things develop ahead, uh, which is in, in and of itself perhaps a positive and great thing, you're deepening your your relationship to life, to existence. Uh, uh, you're experiencing awesome uh, awesome stuff. Uh, you're traveling through tunnels of hell and getting back again, a richer person, then life appears more enchanted than what your mind can explain. So a pressure uh, it starts like it, within. First, it, it, it's not necessarily very intense, but it, push, it pushes all the time, right? Uh, so it makes you feel like, come on, there is a, just, just a little magic. I mean, I can't explain this. It's, it's, it's like too, too wild. There, well, there, there has to be a little bit of synchronicity at least. And then you open the door. Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe even a bit of if I, if I worship this guru figure, then I'm getting the energy through that guru. Well, I, I can feel it. I can't explain it, but I can't feel it, right? Uh, and, and, the, and then you're opening up for magical thinking. And it's a natural thing. It happens, right? It happened to me too. Um, and, and, and then usually these things will balance out over time because after some, some time with some untenable positions or thoughts, uh, usually uh, everyday ordinary life will catch up. You'll get out of the highs. And then also new thought patterns can, can catch up. However, if, if the development is too skewed, there will be magical thinking, there will be reductionism, and, the, and it's just part of life, right? However, as, as a political philosophy or movement, it would be wrong of metamodernism uh, to, to accept magical thinking, because magical thinking simply believe, means believing in something that you can't explain. And when you do that, uh, what's to stop somebody from saying, uh, so I have this sense that we're connecting to the spirit itself. So when we're doing this, it's the spirit of evolution. And this is what integralists have been saying or, or the cult that formed around integralism. Uh, there's the spirit of evolution and you connect to it. Then by automatically, you're doing what the universe ultimately wants. So it's the most important thing in the universe and you can't be wrong. And I'm actually a little bit closer to that point than you are. So you have to do everything I say. 
<laughs> and I'm justified in everything I do to you in the name of that higher force. Um, and, and you're back at totalitarianism, right? And this is literally what happened. And it happens again and again in cult settings, right? And you also, in your question, Ethan asked whether it was a characteristic of, I don't know if you wanted to ask that as a follow-up, because I thought that was a good yeah. interesting point. Yeah, yeah. around the integral specifically, how much of it do you see it being an integral theory itself versus just something that happens to exist in the community of people that happen to follow integral theory? Mm -hmm. so, so integral theory is very tied up with the person of Ken Wilber. Uh, so Ken Wilber had this profile himself. He's a very intuitive thinker, and, uh, uh, and he's a very, very serious uh, spiritual practitioner, which I admire him for. Um, and this does show in his work. Uh, so, uh, so it shows in those rounded edges, in those uh, intuitive, holistic uh, thought patterns, and also in, in his recommendations of, of thoughts, uh, things like Deepak Chopra and, and uh, um, 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 Andrew Cohen stuff and, and so on. Uh, so, uh, and given that that was uh, present in the theory, the theory uh, naturally attracted people within modern society, myself included, who longed for that quality, who longed for spirituality in a rational setting in a modern uh, or postmodern or integral setting, but who wanted to have, have both. And however, because the emphasis is so big on that one, it tends to sooner or later let the other one rust a little bit, uh, including uh, like uh, central tenets of modern thinking or our, our kind of modern thinking like evolutionary theory, which is a problem. And then redefinitions of the evolutionary theory in teleological terms, which is a huge problem because then you can always justify all crimes, kinds of crimes, right? And it can be as totalitarian as imaginable, right? Gotcha. A quick follow-up actually to that. Um, I'm curious if like the prevalence of magical thinking in the spiritual realm speaks to its utility specifically with regard to aspects of inner development. And if you see there's potentially a role for it to still exist, but isolated from the public discourse political realm. Mm -hmm. And uh, as an example, I've noticed that allowing oneself to believe things that on some level are absurd, almost enables access to conscious states that otherwise one can't access and is beneficial in that respect at so long as it can be kept separate and distinct from any sort of claims about how I should organize myself and have power with respect to other people. So it's, it's a very deep question. Um, and I, I, I'm actually in agreement there. So uh, I'm in agreement in the last instance in practice, oftentimes I'm the conservative here. So I will say, let, let's, let's be a little bit careful. However, uh, in theory, that is exactly right. I believe, uh, given that, okay, so, uh, the right brain, uh, right hemisphere, uh, and, um, uh, uh, intuitive, uh, wild, wild, uh, uh, redefinitions of reality as we see it, psychedelic experiences, they thrive on just overriding, um, talking head, right? They, they, that's just what it is, right? Uh, so, uh, there are practices, for instance, within the Burning Man community. Uh, also, uh, they tried some stuff, I think, in synthism uh, of uh, self-suggestion. There is also, um, um, I mean, magic with a CK, right? Um, and and uh, which is uh, self-hypnosis of self-suggestion into radical stuff. And, and stuff they would try in, in uh, the Burning Man community here in Scandinavia, for instance, was this. Uh, one person pretends to be the guru and sits down and then everybody listens. And the, the person who's the guru for 10 minutes or so, everybody has to believe everything they say. They're like, just yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and it's, I mean, it's, it's a self-suggestive process, right? Um, 
but you've set it up so that you've grounded it because you're still in a game, you're still playing, and <laughs> and you'll stop being the guru after after a moment, right? So I agree that the the most powerful spiritual technologies have to do with uh, with the transrational and with uh, completely bracketing anything uh, of, of rational scrutiny. Uh, that's the nature of spirituality. Um, so, uh, I mean, in theory, yes. In practice, of course, uh, it's, it's difficult to achieve the balance. Uh, so in, in private, uh, I'd be all for, for those experiments. But hey, I also have to say, I'm not the expert here. I'm, I'm a social theorist who also writes about this stuff. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Uh, Jochen, I think your question is next upvoted. Hey, Daniel. Good uh, uh, having you here today. Um, yeah, I'm curious if you have, uh, if you're saying, or you're saying uh, Nordic School of Metamodernism is political, and if I, and, and I will re rephrase the question just a little bit. So imagine that you, someone gave you the opportunity to travel into the future, 100 years, 200 years, political problems have all been solved. We all use the Nordic school of metamodernism and we're a perfect society. And you come back to today and you wanna get people to this, not in 100 or 200 years, but like hopefully in like, I don't know, a reasonable amount of time, three, five, 10 years. How much force do you think is it okay to apply or like, is it more something that needs to develop really from the ground up? Like how, wh wh where does it come from? So, so, so uh, it's, it's a very good question. So uh, there are different ways of applying force, right? Um, so one kind of force is, uh, um, I mean, monopolies of violence or, or, or guns or incarceration or anything like that. Um, Another kind of force is symbolic force. With, uh, and because mimetic evolution occurs, um, there is a Darwinian struggle by definition of means, right? And, and, uh, um, and different worldviews are in a certain sense in conflict with one another. I mean, you, you kind of have to make up your mind. You can't be both uh, a devout Christian and a Nazi and uh, like a reductionist scientist, okay. uh, or perhaps, but, but you, you can make examples that are actually incompatible. Uh, and, um, and then it, it, they can of course combine and they can mutate like life does, right? And even the individual can, you, you can, in theory, put together to two organism, and if you do it the right way, they will now be be one organism, maybe with two brains, etc. Right. Uh, so uh, the, the um, and on a micro level, of course, that happens all the time. Uh, so the the, um, the the violence that is applied, and sometimes I, I use violence metaphors, right, and revolutionary metaphors on these things. Um, the violence that is uh, uh, that that is applied is symbolic violence against modernity. So metamodernism wants to achieve the goals of postmodernism. It, it doesn't actually have a lot of ethics. The ethics are roughly the same. Like uh, we shouldn't be racist. We should be caring about one another. We there shouldn't be lots of contradictions uh, in open day, brought up in daylight, and excuses for for power use that are in, in, entirely arbitrary. Um, all of these things are are kind of the same in postmodernism, metamodernism. The difference is metamodernism. Um, uh, grows from the economic uh, and the cultural and informational technological um, conditions of the internet age and uh, uh, works in a different setting where, meta where modernity can be uh, viewed from the outside with the help of postmodern thought and redesigned uh, after deconstruction, reconstruction must follow. Uh, so uh, the, the idea is, uh, and, and this is then both 
existential and political, but it's revolutionary in the sense that we want to destroy modern society. It's like modern society is, a, is beautiful, but it's still not okay. It's not good enough. Just like, hey, Rome was great, but if we live there and um, with slavery and everything and, and, and uh, rampant conquests and oppressions of people all around the Mediterranean, that, that's horrible. And it wasn't sustainable, by the way. Um, so, so, I mean, you'd have to be against it, even if it has its beauties, right? Even if it has aqueducts and, and, and uh, Pax Romana and everything else, right? Uh, and it, so, so it's symbolically violent against modernity. But hey, how do you win symbolic battles? Well, basically, there are two poles, right? There's co-development on one pole, and there's the street brawl on the other. And the low value mean folks or the, the, uh, the, uh, the cruder thinkers and the, the nastier ideologies, they will want to push things in this end, right? Because that's where they'll win, where the most ruthless and uh, the, whoever spent the longest time at the gym will win, right? And who loves mil the military the most will win. And uh, metamodernists will not win the symbolic war. We won't win the world war against modernity if we don't push it in the direction of co-development because our ideas are going to win if there is fair and free del deliberation about it. Um, and if, uh, because they're the attractor points that we are likely to come up with if we work together and go through, not exactly, of course, in, in, the, in, in the ways I have formulated them, but it's something in this direction. So, and co-development builds on trust and trust builds on kindness and kindness builds on friendship. So we have to create friendship in society. And, and the worst thing you can do if you want to create friendship in society is to be a dick and hurt people. So you need to be as nonviolent as possible. Right. So I'd, I'd like to, to throw in my question now, Daniel, which is from, so when we, we did an interview with Jamie Wheel talking about Integral after we did the interviews with Ken Wilber and Jamie talked about how the problem with Integral was it was disembodied eggheads playing at being Jedi. And a, a, a recurring criticism of Integral and there's something and of developmental thinking full stop is that it's almost impossible to read it without immediately placing yourself in the top tier. And that's one of the problems. I was just reading a, a review of your book that was, that was generally very um, positive, but he also, the, the reviewer also said, Hansi's essentially saying, if you get it, you're part of the elite. People who don't get your perspective or hold certain ideals or ideas are at a lower stage of development. They couldn't possibly understand. Um, the kind of people who think that only, so it basically appeals to people who think that they are the kinds of people who need to be put in charge, or if only people were more like them, they'd set society straight and we'd have a more liberal capitalist scientific mindfulness, socialist, egalitarian utopia? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, this is a very, very, very important point. And I, I'd like to actually uh, respond by flipping the question. So is there anybody who doesn't think that their position they came to by traversing other positions that were less good? So... I don't think that is possible because you're obviously going to try and have the best position, right? Now, the difference with stage theories is that you don't make it into a moral question. You make it into a question of privilege. And that's, that's the core of it, right? And, uh, and, you make, and then uh, you try to non-arbitrarily structure and respect all of those perspectives that you traverse, that you believe yourself to, traver to have traversed and you believe yourself to have integrated, uh, just to a certain extent, however, each of those are still generative universes. So postmodernism, for instance, uh, I, I'm working right now on a project called One Project, and the people there, uh, some of them are so much better at me at understanding um, racial injustice, for instance, uh, and, uh, and intersectionality uh, because, uh, well, they're experts in it and they may have had uh, an embodied experience of these injustices that I didn't. Um, and uh, I mean, w within any, any 
like and, and a lot of those things come out of uh, postmodern thinking even if i would say as a as a, a rule as a project one project is is still meta modern in in its values and and uh, and its uh, applications uh, however uh, if you then go to modernist thoughts, I look look at uh, a very talented um, a very talented um, physicist. So most physicists couldn't really be part of this discussion that we're having, and couldn't really comment on culture uh, to the extent that uh, of these these uh, um, discussions are uh, are happening uh, and. At the same time, they're vastly superior, including in, probably in IQ. Uh, and par- in, in any case, when it comes to understanding the physical realities of our, of our world, right? Uh, so, so what developmentalists do is actually the same as everybody else. We're just open about it and more democratic about it, and we pay our dues, or we try to pay our dues. Uh, we, we don't believe that it is the moral impurity of anybody else or their stupidness or something else, right? We believe that these things evolve. Another part of this, on an individual level, which value mean you have, has uh, or, or which, which of these code systems you, you identify with, has basically no meaning whatsoever uh, as to whether or not you're a good or bad or highly functional or not person, right? I mean, high development people develop more pathologies, more magical thinking, more reductionism than others because imbalances become more likely in us. We're also unusual minds. That's what brought us here, the sense of alienation in society and so on. Uh, And we are privileged people who are scaffolded so we have those, uh, we always have that combination or almost always have that combination. You were very unhappy and very privileged at the same time, right? And um, so you had plenty of support. This is also, uh, you know, uh, educational science 101. You want the kids to learn, well, uh, high demands and a lot of support. And so, uh, so obviously everybody is going to think that, if you don't get this, it's because you don't get it. It's not because you have something better. Right? If you have something better, come and show me, right? Um, and the difference is just we, we do it out in the open and with no moral uh, judgments in there. And then in, those, in that hierarchical thinking, uh, which is a thinking of privilege, uh, you also get something very, very nice as a present you get non-judgment, or at least in theory, you get it. Uh, our minds can rail off uh, uh, but, but, uh, and, and judge people because they irritate us or whatever. But, but in theory, at least, or as a, as a, as a cognitive crutch, we get a, 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 an antidote. Like, well, of course, this person is a devout fundamentalist Christian. is not because they're a, high, a stupid hillbilly or something. It's because they grew up in the South and that's what they learned. And this is where that social setting is. And no, it wouldn't work on a, uh, on a global level to apply their ideas. It just wouldn't. It would be a disaster within a few years. Um, so... so Mm, so on a collective level, it makes all the difference in the world what developmental demographics we have, which is why I would decenter a lot of what happens in individualism, which comes out of American culture, after all, which is so individualist. Uh, and I mean, I'm, I'm from a bit more a collectivist culture, which is still has strong individualist values, but... Uh, uh, with the social welfare state and all of that, and and uh, people tend to get in get in line and follow the rules. Um, and I'm a sociologist, right? So so I emphasize those demographic or sociological aspects of this, right? Plus, just want to say, as a bracket in the books, we push a few buttons. That's true. We push a few buttons because if we piss off the readers a bit. 
that makes for mon more fun reading. So that's also part of it. Can I, can I just check, are you using the word privilege in that context in the way that it's commonly understood? Uh, so, so in a in an even wider context, so so the the uh, intersectional would be you know white rich blah blah blah. Um, however, privilege in this wider context is whatever gives you an ability that somebody else doesn't have is a privilege, right? Even if it was through suffering, but now you you grew, you acquired an ability, you now have an ability somebody else doesn't. Well, don't judge the other person for not having it. That's it. So I think we've got time for one final question and Ethan gets to ask two this time. Cool, yeah. So the other one I had in there was, um, to what extent do you think game theoretic dynamics can be transformed or overcome through inner development to open up the space of possible societal configurations Put another way, what are like what's like the upper bounds of just how saintly people can become, in your opinion, through inner development? Uh, so I tend to be pessimist on that part, uh, given that uh, um, I mean, just from my own experience, right? Um, when I first found out about integral, I got into all of these things. I also, you know, also got into Buddhism and spirituality and, and worked really hard on these things. I imagine, and I and I thought I saw also, uh, and the people around me, that wow, this is different. This isn't like when I grew up. You know, this uh, people are more open minded. They're more forgiving. They're more critically minded. Uh, they uh, don't identify as much with the self. All of those things were true. However, old humanity always came back. You know. Uh, in, in different guises, often disguised, right? Um, and envy can show up and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, all, all sorts of weird conflicts, also within myself, you know? Uh, also still do a lot of stupid things, right? Um, and uh, in the end, uh, I'm, I'm actually writing on the weekends, a shorter, simpler book now about... Uh, and not how to become extraordinary, but how to help the extraordinary to become ordinary. Um, it's going to be a little side project just, um, and, and hopefully can come out quicker uh, than, than the history book. It's taken ages. Um, and, uh, and uh, well, at, at least, by the way, on that note, there will be an audio book coming out uh, for, for a listening society by a, a woman uh, named Aurora in uh, California. Uh, made that happen. So, um, I mean, we can't actually become very saintly. However, saintly moments can become more prevalent, right? Because when we're in very high states, even if something really bad happens, we can just switch out of it and we can just act with love. And that happens from time to time. So we can make that less rare and a little bit more, uh, a little bit more uh, prevalent. And the idea then would be not, we go from a dark world to a light world. It's an iceberg of suffering, which it, you know compounds and uh, has, has different chaotic, uh, well, makes loops on itself and so on. And then it melts and this all this mounting of suffering goes down and then new things kind of come to the surface. And that's all. But you still saved us from an ocean of suffering because there is so much of it. So if you just change that a little bit, you've still, you know, changed, saved a million lives, right? I guess we're on time. Yeah. We're on we're on time. Perfectly, perfectly timed. We'll all say goodbye and thank you to to Daniel. Well, and thank you, David. It's been uh, great to be here, and I'm very grateful that you took the initiative. The film you just watched was a conversation that happened in Rebel Wisdom's digital campfire. So to join conversations like this, to submit questions, stay for the after hours hangout to talk about the ideas in the films and to practice and develop some of the skills we talk about on the channel, check out the membership options. There's three different levels of membership. 
sense makers get to join our regular sense maker showcase events with some of the most interesting thinkers around. And also the monthly wisdom gym sessions where we speak to and also have a chance to work with some of the world's best teachers and facilitators. Explorers can join the Rebel Wisdom Book Club sessions, the monthly philosophical journey sessions, and also the regular Skills Academy to practice skills like mindfulness, sovereignty, and sense making. And from now on, all members get to join our monthly AMA sessions with us, where you can ask any questions about anything to do with Rebel Wisdom.